God praise. I believe in one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in a crucifixion By his blood I have been set free I believe in a resurrection Hallelujah, his life is destined free All praise to God the Father All praise to Christ the Son All praise to the Holy Spirit God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. Hope of heaven, He's preparing a place for me Far beyond what hearts imagine Ears have heard or her eyes have seen I believe that a day is coming He's returning to claim His bride Light the altar, keep it burning See the Lamb of To God the Father, all praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and gathering here in person, we are grateful for your presence and hope you have a meaningful experience with us. Later on in our gathering, we'll share communion together, 
so if you haven't done so already, please pick up your communion kit at one of the tables around the worship center. On the screen and on the seat back in front of you, you'll find a QR code you can scan with your phone. This will take you to a page with several communication options. If this is your first time with us, please click on the I'm new button and share your contact information with us so we can provide you with more information about Greenville Oaks. If you're a member or regular attender, please click on the check in button and let us know you're here or that you're watching from home. There's also a button for requesting prayer. We also have an on-site prayer room in the West Foyer where you can go and pray with one of our shepherd couples at any point during the gathering. Finally, you'll notice a button for online giving if you prefer this option over putting your offering in the collection boxes stationed around the room. And if QR codes aren't your thing, you can fill out the appropriate communication card from the slot in the seat back in front of you and put it in the offering box as well. One of the values here at Greenville Oaks is combat isolation. We hope you leave this gathering today feeling more connected to God and to those around you and knowing you do not have to walk this path alone. Good morning, Greenville Oaks. Good morning. Welcome. We are so glad that you are here. If you're a guest, a special good morning to you. And those of you watching online, again, we just want to say thank you for joining us wherever you may be. We're glad that you're here to worship and gather and celebrate uh, with us this morning. We've got a, a very special day planned. One of the things that I want to take just a moment to do is to thank all of you for the way you have journeyed with us through the Project Sightline experience the renovations to our building are coming oh so close to being done. A few more things have happened. The secure locks are now permanently in place and ensuring that our children's area is safe and secure for our kids. There's some additional wall stickers. Our mission statement is now up. There's been some changes to the old Faith at Home Center and some other things, decorations that are going up. We're really getting close. Just a few more things um, that, are, that are left to be done and that will be complete. So this morning, I want to take a moment and I, I just want to thank God and I want to dedicate what we have done here to him and for his work, for his glory and for his good and his church and his, his kingdom. But in doing that, I also want to, want to take just a moment and, and honor some people that are here with us this morning. Uh, if you have been around Greenville Oaks for any period of time, maybe short of the last few months, uh, then you know the name Keith and Cindy Maloney. Keith and Cindy are here with us this morning. Do you guys mind standing? Keith, Cindy, would you please do that? Would you welcome Keith and Cindy Maloney? Keith and Cindy served here for 30 years. Keith served in several different roles, including the, the senior preaching minister here and, and many other, in many other ways, instrumental in helping Greenville Oaks become the church that it is today. We are indebted and grateful for the way God used this couple in so many ways to help us uh, be the church that we are. And many of you have sat in the little family gathering room with the sofas and the chairs and the fake fireplace that's really, really cool, that looks nice, and the coffee bar and all that area. That space was designed for us to have gathering room for people to sit and talk and, and conversate and discuss and share and be with each other. This morning, we are officially announcing that that room is going to be named the Keith and Cindy Maloney Family Room in honor of Keith and Cindy and their life of service to this church. And so thank you. Yes. A well-deserved honor. Let me read this plaque that's going to sit in that room. The Maloney Family Room, dedicated to Keith and Cindy Maloney for 30 years of service to Greenville Oaks. May this room become a place that honors Keith and Cindy's desire and encouragement for Greenville Oaks to be a place where connections happen, where relationships are built, and where people can have meaningful conversations with one another. Above all the impact that they have had in the life of this church, the thing that if you know Keith and Cindy, you know that they care about people and spending time with people, loving people, engaging and walking through life with people. That is, that is who they are and that's what they do. And that space will always be known as the Maloney Family Room for that purpose specifically, for people to spend time with one another. So thank you for all you've meant to this church, both of you. We love you and may that space forever be known as the Maloney Family Room. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. I'm gonna take a moment and just pray and then we'll continue on in our service. If you'll bow with me, please. Father, we are grateful that you have blessed us with this place. Thank you for the space that we meet in to worship every Sunday. 
the halls, the classrooms, the gathering spaces, the coffee bar, the, the spaces that we're with one another. God, we dedicate them and give them to you and ask you to do good things in those spaces. Use us, Father. May they be a blessing to those that are here, every man, every woman, every child that walks these halls. May they be blessed by these spaces. But Father, those that are not yet here, those that are guests, those that are people in our community that may come in contact with this building, may it be a tool for you, a ministry for your church, your kingdom, and your work, God. And we give it back to you and say thank you for the blessing. Thank you for all those that have been a part of helping make it happen. And may you do great and mighty things for your church and your kingdom because of it. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor, Father, in the name of our Savior and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. My name is Michelle Barrick, and this is Samantha Campbell, Samantha Campbell, and we are here this morning to celebrate Family Dedication Day. This is a really special day we set aside to celebrate families who have decided to publicly declare their intent to raise their children in a Christian home. So at this time, I'd like to welcome our participating families to join us on stage. Line up right back here, and we can continue. Moses had some really great words to say to parents because parents have a great responsibility. And here's the advice he gave in Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Moses said the most important thing you can pass along to your children is the knowledge and intense love of their Heavenly Father. It's vital that we continually remind children, and adults for that matter, that God desperately wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us. We will now introduce our parents and our families who have chosen this special day to proclaim their dedication to bringing up their children in a godly home and parenting with us so that their children will know Jesus. Some of our families are represented at worship today, but all of them are represented on the screen. Right, as your family name is called, we'll ask you to step forward. All right. And we'll hold our applause until after the last name is called. All right, the first family is Nora Lana Ajapong, daughter of Andrews Ajapong and Aphrodite Karasira. And Nora just had a birthday yesterday. We have Hudson Scott Brown, son of Kyle and Olivia Brown, Bryn Elizabeth Bird, and Brady Lane Bird, daughters of Taylor and Alyssa Bird, Evelyn Rebecca Davis, daughter of Morgan and Abigail Davis, Hudson Robert Hacker, son of Brandon and Rachel Hacker, Everly Ann Lesh, daughter of Brian and Courtney Lesh. We have River Lee Roseberry, son of Jordan Roseberry and Emily Bogue. Bridger Dale Woods, son of Colby and Taylor Woods. Jake Wesley Worthen, son of Wesley and Rachel Worthen. And our two newest arrivals who aren't with us today, they were born February 9th, Madison Claire Sanders and Owen Scott Sanders, daughter and son of Garrett and Lisa Sanders. On behalf of these parents, I would like to read our covenant. We accept all children as an inheritance from God and this child as a unique gift. We accept all children, we dedicate our child to him, and we dedicate ourselves to do the very best in raising up this child in the Lord. We will teach this child to trust, to walk, and to search for truth. We will tell the stories that build faith and shape character. We will, with God's help, instill within this child a love for God, which will last a lifetime. Parents, please join me in accepting this calling to the Lord by saying, we will.
Wonderful. So today, we, the Greenville Oaks Church, have a part to play in this dedication. As members of this church, we are the extended family for these precious children and their families. We know that parents are the single greatest influence in the life of a child, but they can't do it alone. Church, we can make a difference by partnering with parents and helping these children see and know Jesus. If you'll please stand, we'll read the church covenant together. We will be extended family for these new parents. We will support them with prayer and learn their names. We will offer our personal help and encouragement when needed. We will give our hearts to these families and love them as Christ loved us. Please bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today to give thanks for these children and their families as they dedicate their lives to you. Our prayer is that these children will grow to love you with all their hearts, souls, and minds. We ask that you bless these parents as they raise their children in a way that honors and glorifies you. Amen. For years we've spoken this blessing over many children and um, at Greenville Oaks, and I'm honored today to get to begin your journey at Greenville Oaks with the same blessing that we've passed on for years. May you grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. May you grow like Jesus, Luke 2.52. Let's continue worshiping. Yeah, give them all a hand. We raise kids together, don't we? Some of the most uh, influential times in mine and my wife's life as parents have been through church. So God bless you all. All right, let's continue worshiping together. Here we go.
child of God I found a world of freedom Here's a day
No turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Amen. Have a seat. As we move into communion this morning, we're going to share in a responsive reading that is based out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I will read the leader part, you read the church part, all right? Let's share in communion together. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord... Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and, or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let's eat the bread, drink the cup together. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks in this day for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus we remember the sacrifice of Christ, but we rejoice also in the life everlasting that it provides for us. God, as we as a faith community take this bread, take this cup today, may it renew us, may it restore us, may it keep you ever on the front of our mind for the remainder of this week is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Bread of the Lord. The cup of the Lord. It's been a joy to worship with our children this morning. But now it's the time for them to transition to children's worship age three through fifth grade. We invite you to exit through the doors in the back of the worship center. If you're a guest of ours, if this is your first time with us, you're welcome to go with your child. Check them in at the check-in desk. And you can even attend worship with them so that you're familiar with what uh, they're transitioning to at this time. And for those of us left in the room, let's stand. We're going to worship the Lord, the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee 
you would please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5 opens with Jesus and his disciples landing on the other side of the lake, which was also known as the Sea of Galilee. And that area on the other side of the lake, the other side of the Sea of Galilee, was predominantly Gentile territory. Which means from a Jewish perspective, it was unclean territory. A land populated by unclean people engaged in unclean occupations like raising unclean animals such as Pigs, hang on to that detail, it will come in handy in just a couple of minutes. And when they land on the other side of the lake, they land near a graveyard, a collection of tombs, which was also considered to be unclean. And as soon as Jesus gets out of the boat, 
He's confronted by a man possessed by an unclean spirit. This is a rough neighborhood. What is Jesus doing in such a dark, scary, unclean place? Mark goes into great detail describing the effect this unclean spirit has had on the man. He's living an animal-like existence. He's naked and exposed. He walks among the dead. He's isolated, alone, separated from human contact. He can't control himself, and no one can control him. He's too strong to be bound by a chain. He's engaged in self-destructive behavior. He cuts himself with stones. This evil spirit has dehumanized him. He's alive, but he has no quality of life. The image of God has all but been erased from his being. This evil spirit within the man is able to do something that others, including Jesus' own disciples, have yet to do in the Gospel of Mark. And that is recognize Jesus for who he really is. Mark tells us, beginning in verse 6, that when this man saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you unclean spirit. He uses Jesus' name strategically. He invokes the name of God in an attempt to bind Jesus to gain control of the situation so that Jesus will not harm him. But Jesus is the one who's in control of this interaction. We continue reading. Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A legion could have as many as 5,000 Roman soldiers. That's a lot of evil spirits concentrated in one place, in one person. And that all these evil spirits are compared to the Roman soldiers occupying the land is also worth noting. Neither the Jews nor the Gentiles were thrilled to have thousands of Roman soldiers in their territory. I'm sure some of them wished those soldiers would just go and jump in the lake. Which brings us to one of the stranger sequences in all the Gospels. I better read it, otherwise you might think I'm making it up. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, "'Send us among the pigs!' Allow us to go into them. And he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and went into the pigs. This is how Jesus invented deviled ham. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. All at once, these evil spirits cause the pigs to destroy themselves. Which is also what they were doing to the man over a longer period of time. These pigs belonged to someone. And they were worth a lot of money. And while the man may have been more valuable in Jesus' eyes, he would trade the pigs for the man. Those who owned the pigs didn't necessarily agree. In fact, if you keep reading in verse 15, you'll see that when the people in that area 
come to see what had happened to the pigs. And they see the man calmly sitting before Jesus. This man that had been a nuisance. This man that had disrupted their community. This man that they were terrified of. When they see him sitting calmly before Jesus, they do not celebrate. They are not happy. They are not grateful. They are afraid. And they decide they want nothing to do with Jesus. He's just solved one of their biggest problems. But he's also disrupted part of their economy. And so they beg Jesus to go back to the other side of the lake. Go back to your own people. They want Jesus to leave them and their pigs and their settled way of life alone. Mark also goes into detail about the difference Jesus has made in this man's life. Now, he's dressed and in his right mind. He's in control of himself. His humanity is restored. And understandably, he wants to go with Jesus as Jesus is leaving. He now wants to become Jesus' disciple. But to have a Gentile man following Jesus would be a huge obstacle for the Jewish folks over on the other side of the lake. Now is not the time for that. So Jesus tells him, no, you go home and you tell everyone what the Lord has done for you. The people think they're getting rid of Jesus, yes, but they cannot get rid of this man and his story. His testimony about how Jesus has changed his life. The sower is going to continue to sow his seed on the other side of the lake among the Gentiles through this man. It's a powerful story. This poor man, possessed by a legion of demons, is an extreme example. It's a worst case scenario. But these extreme worst case scenarios can help reveal and clarify Jesus' larger mission. As if, as this story shows, the forces of evil are intent upon destroying all the goodness in God's creation. If they aim to vandalize the image of God within humanity. If this story calls out and shows us in a focused way the havoc evil wreaks in the world and on human beings, then a big part of Jesus' mission is repairing what evil has destroyed. Restoring the image of God in humanity and ultimately defeating the forces of of evil. This is the gospel. This is the good news Jesus announces throughout his ministry when he says, The kingdom of God has come. The reign of God, the power of God, the authority of God over evil is here in me. This is the gospel. Now, this story, and others like it, may, for some of us, raise questions about the possibility of demon possession today. Or it may help explain some strange behavior in your spouse's family. (laughs) But you don't have to believe in or buy into demon possession today to believe in and acknowledge that the forces of evil are still active in this world. And are aiming to destroy every good thing God creates. Please don't allow the question of modern day demon possession to distract you from the larger point Mark is making. And that larger point is evil has no authority in the presence of Jesus. The forces of evil have no power. In the presence of Jesus. They have to ask Jesus' permission to go somewhere else. The legions of evil panic when Jesus' foot touches the ground. Because they know they're in big trouble. 
Which means, this is one of the big takeaways from this story, if we could just get all the annoying, evil people in our lives in front of Jesus, maybe they would stop being so evil or at least so annoying. But that doesn't sound quite right, does it? So one of the challenges of responding to the evil we encounter in the world is that it's almost always easier to see and diagnose evil in others than it is in ourselves. Paraphrasing Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the line between good and evil, the line between good and evil runs not through between good people and bad people. It runs not between our enemies and us. It runs not between two political parties or two different races or two different countries. The line between good and evil runs straight through every human heart. Wouldn't you love for Jesus to come and straighten out all the legions in our world who make life miserable for everyone else? Of course you would, and I do too. What I'm a lot less interested in doing, though, is giving Jesus access to the darkest parts of my heart, which can be just as distorted, just as disruptive, just as evil, as the evil I can so easily see and call out in others. When it comes to the problem of evil in the world, there is no them. They're the evil ones. There is no them. There's only us. When it comes to the problem of evil in the world, there is no them. There is only us. The villagers banished this disruptive, evil man to the graveyard for obvious reasons. But they also didn't want the one who turned this man's life around hanging around and further disrupting their lives. They are just as threatened by Jesus at the end of the story as the evil spirits were at the beginning of the story. They both respond the same way to Jesus. They all want Jesus to go somewhere else. To leave them alone. Don't mess with our lives. Turns out this man was not the only one enslaved to the forces of evil. One of the ways we can make sense of these smaller stories within the Gospels is to always keep the larger, bigger story in mind. So when we see Jesus going into a dark, scary, unclean place to do battle with evil, to overcome evil, it's a preview of things to come. Because we know where this story is heading, don't we? We know how it ends. As many of you are probably aware, and some of you probably don't care, today is the first Sunday of Lent. Lent is a season of preparation, similar to the season of Advent, the different focus. Lent is a season of preparation for celebrating the resurrection of Christ on Easter Sunday. Different groups of Christians, different churches, different communities emphasize different aspects of Lent. But one common point of emphasis is on the essentiality, the inevitability, and the meaning of the cross. Not only for Jesus, what it means for him to die on the cross, but also for those of us who follow Jesus, to follow the crucified one. Today, we begin a six-week journey with Jesus to Jerusalem. A six-week journey with Jesus toward the cross. Where he is stripped naked and exposed. 
where his flesh is torn, where he is isolated in a lonely place outside the city near a tomb, where he is shrouded in darkness and confronted with evil and where he cries out in anguish. What is Jesus doing in such a dark, scary, unclean place like the cross? The same thing he was doing on the other side of the lake. Defeating the forces of evil and shining God's light into the dark, scary, unclean places of the world including the dark, scary, unclean place that is the human heart. On the cross, Jesus is setting us free. Setting us free from the evil around us, about us, and the evil within us. And from the cross, Jesus is sending us out to tell others what the Lord has done for us. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes today to see that you have authority over evil. You have power over evil. That even as we lament all the pain, all the heartbreak, all the devastation evil causes in our world, we, by faith, also cry out to you and trust you to do something about it. And Lord, as we we cry out and as we call out evil, would you also help us to see the places within us, within our hearts, where evil is still exercising its influence. And would you set us free? It's in the name of Jesus we ask this. Amen. Let's stand and sing. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and nevermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. No, I'll never be ashamed. Of the gospel of Jesus Christ How could I ever walk away From the one who saved my life No, I'll never be ashamed Of the gospel of Jesus Christ How could I ever walk away From the one who saved my life How could I ever, could I ever be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ How could I ever walk away From the one who saved my life All praise to God the Father All praise to Christ the Son All praise to the Holy Spirit Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus' mighty name. I believe. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome. The King who was and is and evermore will be In Jesus' mighty name I believe In Jesus' mighty name I believe I believe, I believe
church, go with the Lord. Remember, he reigns and rules over all things. Amen? Go with the Lord.